Hello, everyone. Welcome to our listening party. Thank you so much for joining us today. For anyone who doesn't know, my name is Janet Stewart. I host CBC Winnipeg News here in Manitoba. This is our CBC Newsroom, and this is the desk where I do the news every night at 6. Before we begin, I'd like to start by acknowledging that we are on Treaty 1 territory. It is the land where we live here for CBC Manitoba, where we all work. It is the traditional territory of the Anishinaabe Cree, Oji Cree, Dakota and Dene peoples, the homeland of the Métis. And we are grateful to be here and grateful that you are able to join us. Thank you so much for being here for this big night, CBC Manitoba's listening party and launch of Type Taboo, Diary of a New Diabetic, a new podcast that became available for you today. Right now, one in three Canadians is living either with diabetes or prediabetes. And for people who are university age now, the way the statistics are going, in their lifetime, that will change to one in two Canadians. So right now, 33% of us, and in a couple of decades, perhaps as many as 50% of us with diabetes and prediabetes. So clearly, this is something we need to talk about. We need to know how to stay healthy. Until recently, a colleague of mine, CBC Manitoba reporter Emily Brass, didn't know she was one of them. Type Taboo follows Emily's personal journey from diagnosis to acceptance explores the challenges she's faced and continues to face in, in living with diabetes and managing the shame that for some reason seems to surround type two and shouldn't. Each episode features some really personal conversations with different members of the diabetes community that Emily's connected with. She's trying to shatter myths and break the taboo about the disease. And in the process, Emily herself discovers that living with diabetes isn't a life sentence, it's life changing. And in many ways, it can be life changing for the better. Type Taboo, Diary of a New Diabetic is inspirational. Uh, it's about finding your voice, reclaiming your health through the point of view of a newly diagnosed diabetic who just happens to be a journalist and so asks questions. We're really excited that you've joined us to hear this podcast, to begin your listening journey. Tonight, we're going to be listening to the first portion of the first episode, the first half. It features Laura Siron, who is president and CEO of Diabetes Canada. We're thrilled that Laura is able to join us for this listening party tonight. We're going to hear from her in just a moment. And of course, Emily Brass is standing by to join us too. It is her story and her courage in being personal and, and vulnerable that made this podcast possible. Uh, before we get started, CBC Manitoba wants to give you a present and to say thank you. It's giving away five limited edition CBC Manitoba toques to the first five people who fill out the form that is attached to the QR code right on your screen right now. Here's what you have to do. Grab your smartphone, click on your camera icon, point your phone at that QR code and take a picture. Well, just point it at the QR code on the screen, really. You don't even have to take a picture. You will be redirected to the online form. Fill it out. First five people, get a toque. Good luck. You know, the saying always goes that it takes a village to raise a child. It also takes a village, apparently, to produce a podcast. And we would like to thank and acknowledge the work of all the many people who contributed to Type Taboo, the production team, executive producer, Bridget Forbes, Janice Moeller, Iris Uday, Bertram Schneider, Doug Holmes, and Colton Hutchinson. In addition to our marketing and communication team, the wonderful Gabriella Climes, Justin Dealey, and Gemma Peralta. And I'm not calling them wonderful just because they're the ones controlling what you're seeing tonight, but you know, they are pretty great. So thank you guys. Just before we jump into the program, we have some housekeeping details for you. If you have questions about viewing the event, we have a virtual concierge who can assist you throughout the entire event. I believe her name is Gemma. Hi, Gemma. She's over there. You can't see her. Send your questions to communications.winnipeg at cbc.ca. We'd also really love to hear from you We've got uh, Gabby 
helping, Gemma helping as well, and Justin and me uh, looking for your comments. So please contact us. Feel free to type your comments into the comments, comments section you're going to see on the screen below, the section below that says comments. So without further ado, I'm anxious to hear this wonderful podcast of Emily's. Here is part one, the first half of it, episode one of Type Taboo. Surprise, you have type two diabetes. So it's 12.37 a.m. I'm in my bed awake because of a a bout of anxiety, I guess. Um, It's like a shot of adrenaline to the heart. I wake up gasping. And first thing I think is I have diabetes. This time it was a dream, I think. I was dreaming that a doctor had given me some weird medication and just woke up with this kind of scared, panic feeling in my heart. All right, I'm going to try to go back to sleep now. That was me a little while back. It wasn't long after I found out I have type 2 diabetes. And... I've been feeling pretty down ever since. My grandmother was a type 2 diabetic, but somehow I never thought it would happen to me. I didn't know anyone else who has diabetes, or at least anyone who admitted it. I also didn't know much about diabetes. I've since learned it might make me die younger than I thought. And that's that's kind of freaking me out. I'm Emily Brass, and I have a lot to deal with as a new diabetic. I quickly realized I don't know anyone else with the disease. So I started this podcast to meet other diabetics, dig into the realities of type 2 and the misconceptions. I was stunned to learn one in three Canadians has diabetes or prediabetes. So why aren't we talking about it? Chances are someone you know has the disease. Maybe you have it and don't realize. I also found out 90% of diabetics are type 2, and that diagnosis comes with a big dose of guilt and shame. That can make it hard to talk about, but it's a conversation we need to have, so let's do it. This is Type Taboo. For the first time in my life, I'm on regular medication. I put my pills into one of those containers marked with the days of the week so I don't forget to take them. It's funny, I used to love being able to go to the clinic and say I have no health problems, no prescriptions, but now there's a lot to fill out on those medical forms. I found out a few years ago I was pre-diabetic. At the time, I didn't even know what that meant. I'd been moving around a lot for work and didn't have a regular doctor. I was living in BC doing shift work. My job started at the ungodly hour of 4 a.m., so I often felt fatigued, kind of like jet lag. I now know sleep deprivation put me at higher risk of diabetes. I dropped by a walk-in clinic one day after my daily nap for something completely different. They ordered a blood test, and when I went back a few days later, the doctor on duty told me my blood sugar was really high, like on the edge of diabetes high. I still remember how that felt. I was perched on the exam table, had that crinkly paper under me, and I felt stunned and speechless. Like, how could this be happening? You know, I've been eating mostly vegetarian for years, ate plenty of whole grains, lots of veggies. I mean, sure, I had some treats, and I definitely drank my fair share of beer. But I also went for walks, like, every single day, even when the weather was bad. Anyway, the doctor asked me, if I drink pop or if I eat junk food. And I was like, no, I had actually just lost 30 pounds. And he was like, wow, I wonder what your blood sugar was before. And that definitely didn't make me feel any better. As it turns out, he was just the first of many doctors who would blame me for getting diabetes. One of them even laughed at me. 
like right in my face when I said how hard it is to lose weight. They all offered to put me on drugs, but I'd say, no, I want to fix it myself through diet and exercise. So they'd send me off with some little pamphlet and wish me luck, and then I'd head off on my own. A few months later, I moved again, and I was under a lot of stress. I was adapting to a new job and a new province, and the weight started to creep back on. This is CBC News. Good afternoon. I'm Emily Brass in Winnipeg. It's four. Yes, that's me. I'm a radio news anchor for CBC Manitoba. It's a pretty high paced job and I've worked hard to get here. I've often put my career before other things in life, including my health. It's still hard for me to admit that without crying. I recently went to a walk in clinic here in Winnipeg. I got another blood test. But this time it was different. The doctor asked how long I've had type 2 diabetes. I was confused. I started to say, well, I'm pre-diabetic. And she totally cut me off, waving her hand in the air, and she said, you are diabetic, okay? She put me on metformin, which I now know is one of the most prescribed drugs in the world. And that was the day my blood sugar went from an afterthought to a matter of life and death. It's made me think about my grandmother a lot, all the health challenges she went through with type 2 diabetes, the physical and emotional pain right up until the end. Why didn't I think more about that before my diagnosis? I started recording my thoughts in an audio diary. So the thing that gets me the most is the guilt. I get so mad at myself for not taking the warnings more seriously. Um, I did obviously make some changes. I was trying a number of different programs and changing my diet, but maybe with not enough urgency. So I'm mad at myself for not looking into it more. I mean, I'm a journalist. I should have done more research. And also just mad at the system for not making me realize how important this was. There's still a lot of hope for putting diabetes into remission. That's what I'm focusing on now. I'm trying, trying to reach that goal. It's scary. It's upsetting. Yeah. Hmm. Tough emotions. I also started feeling pretty alone. I've been noticing nobody talks about it. As far as I can tell, I'm the only person I know with diabetes. But that can't be true when a third of Canadians are affected by the disease. And all kinds of factors can lead to type 2 diabetes. Body type and obesity often plays a role, but so can your genes, your ethnicity, income level, mental health, and your environment. But that sense of shame for being seen as fat or for making unhealthy choices, that keeps a lot of people from talking about diabetes, and that's really dangerous. One and a half million Canadians are believed to be walking around with diabetes or pre-diabetes and don't even know it. Like me, many find out after a blood test for something else. It all started to feel surreal, like I'm playing this bizarre game and no one taught me the rules. It's time to play Surprise! You have type 2 diabetes. Our contestant today is Emily Brass. Emily, which door do you want to open? Hmm. What's behind door number one? Kidney disease. 50% of diabetics have kidney problems and some end up on dialysis. We're just getting started. Emily? Which door do you pick next? Geez, not much of a prize there. Hmm. Okay, uh, let's see. How about door number three? Eye disease. Diabetes is the leading cause of blindness in Canada. Guess what, Emily? You get to play again. What'll it be this time? Okay, I'm not sure I like this game. I guess I have no choice. Door number two. It's the big one, heart attack and stroke. 
diabetics are three times more likely to be hospitalized for cardiovascular disease. And it's the leading cause of death for diabetics. Thank you, Emily, for playing Surprise! You have type 2 diabetes. The more I learn about the consequences of type 2 diabetes, the more I realize how hard it is to come out a winner. High blood sugar is the third biggest cause of premature death worldwide, right after high blood pressure and smoking. But most Canadians can't identify any of the symptoms. Months after my diagnosis, I was depressed and confused, and I still hadn't met anyone else with type 2, even though I wanted to. How do they handle their condition, physically and emotionally? And do they ever feel judged? I also wanted to find out how their diagnoses went, were they left feeling as clueless and helpless as me? I would go back and give anything for someone to say, oh, this A1C, let me explain what that is. And it's starting to get a bit high in you. That's Laura Siren. She was diagnosed with type 2 diabetes by a doctor who was filling in for her GP. That A1C she mentioned is how doctors gauge your glucose level. Most type 2 diabetics go for a blood test every three to six months. An A1C of 6.5 or higher indicates diabetes, but most Canadians have no idea what their A1C is. That included Laura a few years back. It was a relief to finally talk to someone else with diabetes, but knowing what she does for a living in the boardrooms of Toronto, I didn't expect her diagnosis story to be so similar to mine. She told me about it during a video chat while she was working from home. I'll never forget, I was sitting in the chair and she turned her chair and she just looked in my eyes and she said, you have diabetes. It, and actually, you know when you almost can't comprehend? Like, like I said, pardon? I said, could you say that again? You know, like I, I had an annual checkup every year. I had my blood work every year. I had like... And, and she said, well, uh, you know, I guess your A1C has been going up over time and I'm not sure why your other doctor didn't say anything, but you know, um, not to panic. And then that was terrible. Cause I was like, oh my God, am I supposed to panic? I wasn't sure how to react either. So it's actually kind of reassuring to hear someone else felt the same way. Laura has a lot of energy and sometimes speaks with her hands. She wears stylish black glasses and her long wavy hair sways around a little under her headset mic. Laura got the same vague advice as me to diet and get more exercise. She also had that same sense I did, that it all felt a bit unreal. I felt completely blindsided. I didn't even know what to ask. So I left and like I just walked to the subway. <laughs> it's just like, I don't even know like, even at a simple level, is this good or bad? I mean, obviously it was bad, but like, is it as bad as, you know, you have MS or you have, you know, stage one breast cancer? Like, and I'm not trying to compare diseases, but I just had no frame of reference. So I got home and my husband's like, so how did it go? I said, well, it was kind of weird. He goes, what, what do you mean weird? And I said, apparently I have diabetes. And he, he was like, you what? And he's like, well, what does that mean? And then at least I felt better, like, okay, well, it's not just me. And I said, you know, actually, I don't really know. I didn't ask her a lot of things. He's like, well, maybe I'll ask my mom. And my first reaction to was like, you're not telling anyone I have this. And he's like, why? I said, it's embarrassing. I think I have it because I've gained weight. I probably gave it to myself. I said, no, you, I don't want you to tell anyone. He goes, Laura, like, that's not even like you. What are you talking about? I said, no. That was my urge at first, too, to keep it quiet. Like so many of my relationships revolve around going out for food and drinks. I was worried that cutting back on things like burgers and beers might make people uncomfortable, and that could cost me some friendships. So like me, Laura initially decided to tackle diabetes all on her own. Well, that was a complete disaster. <laughs> But I think my denial, I was just like, well, I'm not going to go look this up. I'm just going to try to eat better and like almost pretend that this didn't happen in a way. If I take medication, I'm acknowledging that this is real and that now it's, I'm a diabetic and, and I, I don't want to say that. And if I'm not on medication, then maybe I'm not. 
and uh, of course my A1C went up. And she said, uh, okay, so this is not, um, you know, this is not going so well. And I think we should maybe start thinking of getting you on some metformin, some, some drugs. So a few years went by and Laura continued to keep her diabetes a secret until she landed this big job. She's now president and CEO of Diabetes Canada. And she says coming out as a diabetic sent shockwaves across her social circles. There are some people that I have worked with over the years and I thought knew quite well who when I, they said, oh my God, I read in the Globe and Mail or I read wherever that you, you said you have diabetes and they lean into these Zoom calls like this and they say, um, so do I. And I had no clue. And I was like, okay, this is crazy. I have known you for 20 years. You know, you've been a high achieving person. Did no. that make it harder? That sense yeah. of, oh, I failed at this because you're so used to achieving at so many other things? A hundred percent. And I am definitely an A-type person. And that definitely made it harder because I hold myself to a high standard. And again, it sort of felt like that can't be true. Like, I, I don't, you know, I don't get things like that. Like, what does that even mean? When I'm saying it out loud, it sounds silly, but but <laughs> it's in your head. I know what that's like. I'm a bit of a perfectionist myself. From fronting a rock band to reporting for the national, I've always made sure every little detail was just right. Like, I don't want to play a single bad note or leave a spelling mistake in my scripts. So admitting that I didn't succeed at keeping diabetes at bay kind of feels like a failure. And that's been a challenge for Laura too. I still struggle with coming clean on it. So even doing this podcast, I was a bit nervous. Um, but what I've learned at Diabetes Canada is I wasn't hearing a conversation around type 2 diabetes, whereas I hear conversations about Alzheimer's, I hear conversations about cancer, I hear conversations, if I think mental health 10 years ago, there weren't conversations, and there was a lot of stigma. Now you hear conversations, and I thought, okay, well, I need to start disclosing. And the fact that I even use that word is telling that I'm disclosing my diagnosis. Why do you think that is that there's not a conversation about diabetes happening when one in three Canadians has prediabetes or diabetes? Why is no one talking about it? Yeah, it's a great question, Emily. I think part of what we're going to start doing at Diabetes Canada is doing some deep consumer insight work, like to try to get under that. Because I've asked since I've started, are, are these conversations happening better in any other countries? And the answer is no. And when I've talked to some of the uh, major corporate partners about, you know, is this the sense of no conversation happening? And they said it's one of the biggest barriers. So nobody's, and I'm calling it cracking the code. How do we crack the code on talking about diabetes? Welcome back. I'm Janet Stewart here in the CBC Manitoba News Room, and we're listening to Type Taboo. Surprise, you have type 2 diabetes. That's episode one of the podcast. First half of it, anyhow. I hope you're finding it as interesting as I am. Wow, I learned a lot in those 18 minutes. I want to bring Emily Brass in right away. Emily is the host. She's the woman whose story sparked this whole conversation. And I thought I was going to be able to wait to the end of tonight to tell you this, but I have to say right now, Emily, as a colleague of yours who knows how hard it was, like I talked to you about this many times, we're journalists. We don't open up our own personal lives, right? I'm so proud of you. You've in just 18 minutes taught me so much. Thank you. And you know, you're right. You know, journalists were, were trained actually not to reveal our emotions, to stay neutral and stay out of the story. So this was a completely new experience for me. I had to write and look at the story in a completely new way. So that was transformational as well. I uh, will talk to Laura in just a moment. Um, but wow, to hear the CEO of Diabetes Canada talking about shame disclosing her status is that's that is absolutely shocking. Where does this sense of shame and failure come from, do you think? 
Well, you know, it's been a widespread myth for many, many years that type 2 diabetics are completely to blame for their condition and that it's 100 percent, you know, uh, preventable. But the science has shown that's just not true. There are so many other factors involved. Number one, your genes. You know, most people who have it have a relative who also has it. But there's so many other factors, our stressful lives, the modern lifestyle where it's even hard to find healthy food, right? It's much easier to find fast food and much cheaper. Um, so, you know, poverty will set barriers between you and health and self-care. Um, things like systemic racism and uh, food deserts, lack of transportation, you know, stress, mental health, sleep deprivation. There are so many factors behind it. And yet the widespread understanding or misunderstanding is that we're completely to blame. If you got type two, you can blame yourself for it. It's you're just everything you're saying is striking a chord in terms of like how I live, you know, mm -hmm. um, how I sit all day long. And I yes. think I'm doing well because I got a stand up desk. Mm -hmm. you know? Yes. Well, my relatives in England, just a generation or two ago, they went everywhere on foot and on by bike. You know, they didn't have cars. They did physical labor for a living. They had a garden. Everything they ate came out of the garden. You know, it's just like our lifestyle has changed so much in just a blink of an eye. And, you know, we're dealing with that now, the consequences of those changes of this sedentary lifestyle we have. I was struck. Uh, I was struck by so much. <laughs> I don't know where to start. I've completely taken the list of questions. <laughs> and I'm just going to have a conversation with you. Um, okay. You mentioned um, maybe you have it and you don't know it. I wrote that down. Mm, yeah, I know. Well, that was me. And it's funny, one of the main symptoms, because the symptoms for diabetes are fairly subtle, you know, it's things like feeling tired all the time or, you know, feeling hungry or like things that could be easily attributed to something Anything. else. One of the main ones that's maybe a little more obvious, though, is excessive thirst and going to the bathroom a lot. And all of a sudden I was like, oh, my goodness, like that's been me most of my life. Everyone has even commented, wow, you drink a lot. You go to the bathroom a lot. And, you know, it makes me wonder now, how long did I have high blood sugar before I knew? I've had my I get my blood sugar checked regularly, but I'm always feeling thirsty and I'm mm. always needing to go to the loo. Yeah. So, I will be Dynacare. I'll mention this. Yes. And I'll talk to Laura about this too, is offering free A1C tests until no, uh, December 6th. So reach out to your Dynacare uh, mm -hmm. lab and get yourself tested, everybody, because this is just, we, we need to stem the tide and we need to have people. The game show. Mm. I don't know whose idea it was to put the game show in as part of the podcast, but wow, that was scary. Yeah. Well, you know, it was effective. I came up with the idea because it's kind of how it felt like uh, there was, uh, you know, what's behind this door? What's behind that door? Like uh, the more I was learning about diabetes, like more how scary the consequences could be, you know, and it just came out of nowhere, out of left field. Like I said, it was a blood test for something completely different. And all of a sudden my world changed and the serious consequences and finally understanding what diabetes even is after being diagnosed, you know? So yeah, it was a very surreal time. There are six episodes in the podcast. Is you got a lot of ground to cover yet? We haven't even scratched the surface. Yeah. Is there one that episode that really or moment that really stands out to you? Oh, it's so hard to say. You know, there, I met so many phenomenal, brave people who opened up about diabetes, um, who've had such similar, you know, experiences to Laura and I. Um, I think about, you know. Janice Headley, she's a senior who is now struggling with her feet and she used to love to walk everywhere. And now she can barely walk because she's dealing with numbness and uh, neuropathy what is what it's called. And it's so similar to my grandmother's story that I, you know, almost see my grandmother and her. So that touched me a lot. But, you know, I met Jackie and Isaac McKee from Weiwei Sakapo First Nation. They both have diabetes. It runs rampant in their family. And they were so open about the mental health struggles that you have as a diabetic. It's just as important to treat as the physical. We go through a lot when you get, you know, a progressive disease as a diagnosis. There was Jennifer Lopez, a young Winnipegger who was got type two at 12 or was diagnosed then. And when she turned 18 and aged out of care, she could no longer afford her insulin. So she was figuring out ways to cut her dose in half and how to make it last as she was going to college. And, 
you know, I went through a lot, came through the other end, and now is working for child and family services as a social worker. She wants to teach the young people about type two and how to avoid it. And, you know, just outstanding people. But I think the biggest surprise was when later in episode one, I get to speak to Dr. Catherine Smart, who's president of the Canadian Medical Association. And I told her about my experiences, about the doctor laughing at me and she apologized and said, there's no place in medicine for shaming. And that we really, you know, shame is behind so much of the problems. And she, you know, touched on things like colonization and epigenetics and all these factors that are out of control, our control. And she's saying, you know, that's going to be a big shift in healthcare coming soon in the way that doctors talk to their patients about diabetes and about their weight. And, you know, where she wants to undo the stigma. So let's hope that happens soon. Absolutely. Uh, you went from walking clinic to walking clinic. You didn't, you were moving as a lot of people do for work, but the sad truth is in a lot of provinces in Canada, it's hard to find a family doctor. I'm originally from Nova Scotia and I know the waiting list there is 77,000 people, you mm -hmm. know, waiting. <laughs> so yes. mm -hmm. how do you think that impacted your health story? A lot. In fact, that's something I talked with Dr. Smart about was just the, I mean, 5 million Canadians don't have a regular doctor. And she said, you know, that's, you're just, she's like, it's not just my opinion. This is the data. You need a family doctor to deal with a, a serious disease because you're just not going to get that quality of care with someone who doesn't know you, doesn't understand your situation, your career, your, you know, everything in your background. And that's, you really need someone who's going to deal with you for the long haul. And luckily, I have managed to find a family doctor now who's quite nice and quite supportive. So that's helped a lot. Oh, I'm so happy for you. Uh, I just want to mention again that please join the conversation here. I've just received a comment from one of our listeners, but I'd love to hear your comments too. Uh, we can find you answers and, and Emily's right here to answer your questions. There is a comment section on your screen. Please join the conversation. Uh, we were talking a moment ago, Emily, about what I thought was a really smart idea using the device of the game show. And mm -hmm. I think I recognized the voice of the yes. game show host. Yeah, your partner, <laughs> on-air partner, that is, uh, John Sauter, our weatherman. You know, when I thought, who could do the game show? Oh, well, of course. And he even asked me, okay, you want me to lay it on thick, like 80s, like Monty Hall? I was like, exactly. And he did such a great job. <laughs> yeah, that's wonderful. And he's a good guy to do that, too, because he's, he's <laughs> so conscious of health issues. Um, we've got a question from Emrod asking, do you notice any differences between the way men or women react to or deal with diabetes in your interviews? Not especially, you know, um, everybody was pretty blown away when they were diagnosed. You know, I mentioned Isaac uh, from Way Way Sacapo. He was only 12 when he found out and he found it incredibly hard because he was just becoming a teenager and all of a sudden the doctor's saying, well, you shouldn't eat junk food. When you go out with your friends, you got to order salad and that all got very overwhelming and, you know, took him to the edge. Um, so I would find that it's pretty similar experience to all of us from what I hear. And in fact, since the podcast has come out today, I've been getting notes from diabetics who I don't even know from all over Canada who are writing and saying, wow, this story is so similar. I felt so much shame and blame myself for years. Some are still dealing with it a decade later and they're saying, thank you for opening up this conversation at last. And I'd say those notes have come about equally from men and women. How do you feel about getting them? How does that feel? Oh, it feels great. That's exactly what I wanted to happen by doing this podcast. I kind of put two and two together. It's like, okay, wait, I was made to feel ashamed and I'm noticing nobody talks about it. Hmm. Is that because everybody's embarrassed or feeling like it's their fault that they have it, you know? And is that really true? So I had all these questions and, and when I realized, you know, there was so much more to it, I was like, and that the rates are just getting out of control. We have to talk about this now. And I could not believe that we didn't know more about this already. Let's bring in Laura Siron. Laura standing by. She's president and CEO of Diabetes Canada. Laura, thanks for being here. And thanks for sharing your story. We just need to unmute your mic. And Justin may be already on it because he's so good. Can you hear me now? Yes. Yeah. Sorry about that. Um, so thank you for having me. And um, was it was kind of hard to hear that, actually. Um, but I feel like a sisterhood with Emily <laughs> um, yeah. because I felt the exact same way and sometimes still do, even 
though for my day job i am president and ceo of diabetes canada but it's um as emily said it's it's sort of um it's just not talked about you know that that's not the thing and so um it's nice to bring it out in the open and feel like i don't have to be ashamed well, you know, Brene Brown, let's talk shame, shame researcher. Yep. She's very famous for saying things like shame only can live in the dark. Yep. You bring it into the light and it dies. Yep. So let's bring this out into the light and get rid of that shame factor. Yep. Um, it, it's su surprising to see, to hear you, Laura, to say like, uh, you know, to your husband, no, don't tell anyone. Yeah, and um, he then later told my mother-in-law, and I didn't know that, and we were down visiting her, um, and she said, oh, I'm really sorry to hear that, and I was so angry at my husband. Meanwhile, she was being so supportive. She was like, how can I help? But that didn't matter. It felt like it wasn't his news to share, and so I've, I've worked hard at trying to figure out, you know, what that is and um, why, and, and I must say that when I when I do disclose to people, for the most part, I've had nothing but very positive responses. It's still hard though. Like, um, because I don't know if Emily feels this way because it's still, um, it f still feels isolating and, and a little, it's, it's not like, oh, lots of people have that, which they do. <laughs> I mean, as Emily said, they just, they just have to. And as I said, in the clip you heard there, the oddest thing for me is, uh, there's people I've known for years who I'm on Zoom with or I'm talking with and they say, you know, me too. But again, they lean in and they whisper. They go, me too. And I'm like, okay, it's just the two of us. We're here. We've known each other for So something very deep psychologically is is going on with that. And um, so for me, it's it's about working that through and and really starting to sort of crack that code and change the conversation. Have you gotten anywhere in figuring out where the code begins? Like where this comes from? Yeah, so um, I think probably there's many answers to that question. So I think um, some of it definitely is the belief that, as Emily was saying, is that diabetes is something, at least type two, as opposed to type one, is something you bring on yourself. Almost like if you think about lung cancer, and there's many people who develop lung cancer who never smoked, but there's this mm -hmm. sense of, well, they must have smoked, therefore it's their fault. So I, I think there's this sense, and, and it is true that part of being physically active and, you know, and uh, watching rate can help with that. But as Emily said, it's not the whole picture. It's a small part of the picture. I, I think the other thing is, um, the link to obesity and if you think about um how much in our society there's really a lot to unpack around shame and obesity and and being heavy and then i think culturally too and so one of the things that diabetes canada we're starting to do is having conversations with different cultural communities and different communities because I think it may be different in the South Asian community than in the black community, than in the indigenous community. And I think, so part of your answer, Janet, may be different in those communities. And some of the South Asian communities have a sense of, well, it's actually not that bad. It's just called the sugars and we all have it. So that's almost downplaying it. And that can be bad too, because, well, no, I don't really have to stay on the medication. It's just the sugars. Everyone in my family has it. So I think there's different um, there's different things underneath that. And I think, you know, we'll we'll spend the next little while really talking with Canadians, trying to change that conversation and really try to get under why do you feel that way? And I think part of it too is not all and thank God I too now have a great family health uh, doctor, like a family doctor that that really helps me a lot. But um, I think if you take the risk and open up, Janet, and then you got laughed at or shut down or blamed, it's very hard to come back again to that, yes. right? And so I think there's, you know, and I think there's some unconscious bias. I mean, I'll, I'll even say yesterday was World um, Diabetes Day. And this morning, um, the diabetes Twitter was... Um, was all up in arms because the World Health Organization, 
So the World Health or WHO put out a little thing to celebrate the day saying we should all be aware of type one. And it had a child and then said, and people with type two, and it was someone sitting in a recliner eating a bag of potato chips. Oh man. Whoa. And so everyone's like, are you kidding me? They're not even on your side. It feels like it feels like this. What stereotype? So they pulled down the tweet and they apologized. But if the World Health Organization is reinforcing that stereotype, it's no, it's the person who did the social media post and who grabbed something (laughs) and grabbed something nice and and just thought, oh, okay, well, that's what type two is about. But if that's really your underlying and that almost plays on my fear that if I'm going to say I have type two, that that's the image that pops into people's minds. It really and is I, all of us, though. We all spend too much time sitting eating potato chips. <laughs> and maybe just half of us are lucky that yes. we don't also have the genetic predisposition or whatever. Yes. To, uh, or, you know, we have the means, as um, as Emily was saying, to, you know, eat healthier or we have more support. I think mental health um, at the time I was getting diagnosed um someone in my family was having pretty severe mental health problems. And so one of the doctors later said to me, well, you know, they're stressed induced diabetes. I've never heard that since, but I do think it builds on what Emily was saying is if you're living in a lot of intense stress, um, that can really, you know, um, kind of amplify and augment what might have already been going on. So it basically what you have to, what I'm learning is there's so many reasons and, even if it was my fault, which it isn't, it doesn't help to think that way. So it doesn't matter. It's now you have it. And the more you learn about it and the more you can get support from other people, actually the better you'll be. And the better you'll be, all those consequences, because I had the exact same thing as Emily, like I, maybe about a year after my husband and I were starting to do some retirement planning, you know, probably 15 years away or something. And I said, well, if I don't manage my diabetes, I can die 10 to 15 years earlier. So I'm like, should we be doing this planning? And he's like, what are you talking about? And I said, but that's, that's actually diabetes. And again, people don't know. Like the, the other thing I think that does get under this, Janet, um, is that people think insulin's a cure. Yeah. And that's a misconception. I mean, it's a very, very important and, you know, biggest probably Canadian medical discovery ever. Um, and without it, millions of people would have died. And that's no exaggeration. I mean, literally, it's a lifesaver. But it's a treatment. It's not a cure, right? And and I think that also is kind of people think, oh, well, okay, so you got diabetes. Okay, that's not great. But there's insulin, right? So what's the big deal? And the answer is, do you know what it's like to live with it? Do you understand all the calorie counting? Do you understand, you know, thinking through, like, am I having my eyes checked? What's my A1C? Like, it's basically living now for the rest of your life with a chronic disease. And people, like, there's just no understanding of of that, right? So um, I, I think the idea that, well, you've got it solved with insulin, that also leads to the stigma because they don't, people don't understand, well, why are you so upset? You know, like, you know, because there's a way to fix it. The answer is no, there's no way to fix it. Have you come across that, Emily, as well? I have, actually. Some people instantly go, oh, well, you know, you can manage that. You know, like just an instant reaction like that. And um, I was also going to say, like, Laura had even mentioned this, that, you know, people don't realize it's something that can lead to your death because often what actually kills you is the next thing that was caused by the diabetes. So people will say, oh, well, they died from a heart attack, but they won't say, well, they had diabetes for 25 years before they had that heart attack, you know, or they died from kidney disease. Well, they were a diabetic, you know, there's so many things that cause your death but it's for, through the diabetes. But even in death, people are ashamed and won't say they were diabetic. They'll say, oh, no, they died. You know, they had a stroke or whatever. Right. So I can imagine myself having someone I love, a friend come up to me and say, I've just been diagnosed with diabetes, or pre-diabetes, imagining myself going, well, that's OK. You'll be fine. Like trying to cheer them up by saying comfort them yeah. in some way. But yeah. that is clearly not what's what should we do as the people who love you 
to support our friends and community members when we hear that they have this diagnosis. Yeah, I mean, Emily, I don't know about you, but what I would say is is two things. Uh, the first is, um, you know, a sense of, um, wow, that like, that's, um, I didn't know that or, um, you know, like, thank you for, you know, I'm glad you felt comfortable to tell me, you know, and, and so as a first response, and then, um, you know, that must have been hard to hear. How are you doing with that? Like, th imagine if someone said, I have breast cancer, all right? Like, it's not just, don't worry. <laughs> like, like the acknowledgement of, wow, that, that, you know, thank you for sharing that. And how are you? Because that must be, that must be, you know, that's a big thing. Like, just even to me, if someone said that, it's just showing that they're, they're not minimizing it. And they're not, um, you know, and then if they followed it up, Janet, with, is there anything I can do to help? And for the most part, what I say to people is, you know, if I need an ear, will you listen? You know, like that's kind of for the most part what I say. Because, you know, it's, um, the only other thing, I guess, sometimes for me, Emily, I don't know about you, but you were talking about the beers and burgers is <laughs> I, I don't want to be policed. Right. I don't want to be policed. So like if I'm at a family party and someone's having cake, like the first couple of times people were like, oh, but not for you. And I was like, and I think they were trying to be like nice, you, you know, but it was like, oh, like, I don't know. I just, I felt um, like they were big brother. It's like, that's my, it's my body. It's my decision. If I want a little piece of cake, I'm managing my blood sugars. So, um, you know, it, just, I, I know they were trying to be nice. But there's so many instances where we're in social settings and, um, and and we hear at Diabetes Canada all the time about, you know, the kids with type 1 going to birthday parties and how hard it is and that kind of stuff. And so, again, I think if parents who are hosting kids like that can just talk about what's the way you want this talked about, mm -hmm. you know, how do you want this to unfold to the parents? That, that's what I would say. One quick point about the party too. I uh, a friend of mine just invited me to a party, and she actually asked me in a private conversation, "What snack should I have?" You know, so <laughs> she didn't say for you or whatever, but she wanted me to say have this, have that, and I find that's very sweet. People who are making sure that I, you know, there's food on the menu that I would like to partake in, and that kind of just those little things help a lot. Yes. Well, that's good to hear. We've got a question from Christine Leader. Hi, Christine. Thank you for watching. And please, anyone else who's out there, remember that, that you too can join the conversation. Christine wants to know, with so much focus on public health and talking about access to healthcare in Canada in the last year and a half, do you think as a society, we're ready to be more holistic about how we address diabetes? Laura? Yes and no. I, I think, um, you know, there's lots of good work going on in Canada and around the world about being more holistic about using nutrition as a way to put your diabetes in um, remission. And Emily was talking about that a bit. And I think we absolutely have to be open to that. I, I think um, if by being more holistic, you know, I wouldn't ever support someone saying, go off your metformin and try this. Like, I mean, I think you want to follow the evidence and the science. I think if you mean more holistic around, if we could uh, build our environments to be more walkable, if there weren't food deserts, um, if uh, we had um, jobs that, uh, you know, had more mental health support, diabetes support, people weren't rationing their insulin, that kind of stuff. It, those kind of holistic, that would not only improve diabetes, it would improve many other diseases as well, right? And so so in that way, yes. At the base, I, I was talking to a diabetes researcher, Dr. Michael Vallis from Nova Scotia, and one of the things that's hard about diabetes is though, is human beings by their very nature um, will pick the short term over the long term. So Emily and I both live with something where it's like, do you want this piece of cake now? If you have that now, your life might be shortened 10 years from now. And it's, and human beings will always defer to the, to the more urgent, like the one that's right there in front of them. And the other thing is we tend to choose pleasure over pain. So I don't know about you, Emily, but I get off the subway and I see the escalator and the stairs. I know for my diabetes, I should take the stairs. 
I know it'll make me out of breath and make my heart and my body goes, go for the escalator. And with diabetes, you're, you got to try to choose the long term over the short term and pain over pleasure. Well, that's not how human beings brains work at some very reptilian level, right? So it, it's, it's hard. And so holistically, are we ever going to get over that? I don't think so. But um so yes, We're actually, no. go ahead, Emily. I just wanted to add one thing about the remission thing. That was how I felt at first. And I, honestly, I think that was part of the denial thing of like, oh, oh I'm not going to be a diabetic forever. I'm going to go into remission. But then I spoke to an expert from the University of Manitoba, Dylan McKay. He may be listening right now. And he was the one who actually said, hmm, that's your goal, huh? And usually everyone was like, hell yeah, put it in remission. He was like, you know, you might have to go down to like 600 calories a day and you might have to, you know, work out all the time. And he's like, you might make yourself absolutely miserable to go into remission. Are you sure you don't want to just stay on metformin and enjoy your life? And so that was another transformation. And that goal changed to more small, manageable goals. And you'll see the progression and my changes in me through the course of the podcast. We have uh, a question. We're running out of time because we're having <laughs> such a good time chatting. Um, but uh Fabiola Carletti wants to know at the very beginning, I mentioned the statistics that right now it's one in three and that uh, for people who are university age, this is something I heard you say, Laura, on our newscast yeah. tonight. Yeah. In their lifetime, it's going to go up to one and two. Yeah. Can you it's, say more on why that is? Yeah, mostly it's actually those environmental factors that Emily and I have both been talking about. So again, in our society, it's easier to eat the fast food than the healthy food. As we move from a more... Uh, you know, uh, rural to urban settings, a uh, lot of built environments. So a lot of subdivisions, not even built with sidewalks. The cities are built with cars. So essentially, as you look around the globe, actually, as people have moved from rural to urban, heart disease, diabetes have all spiked up. And so for, for our children, and I have a son who's 21, and it's really hits home for me, um, the, the environment in which we're living is not encouraging them to prevent their diabetes. Um, and also what we can do is what you were mentioning. I was so glad you mentioned Dynacare. If there's one piece of advice I give to people now is do you know your A1C? Mm, and yeah. if it's awesome, great. But every year ask your doctor, what's my A1C? And people are like, I don't even know what an A1C is. We got to change that. That's your blood sugar level, right? It's your blood sugar level, right? And, and it's a simple blood test. Dynacare, I know I know in Manitoba, because I've been talking to our Manitoba chapter here, is offering these free tests until December yes. 6th as part of Diabetes Awareness Month. Laura, is that true across the country? Right now they're doing it in Manitoba and they've just started piloting in Ontario. Okay. So same thing. And if it keeps going well, and on top of it, they've been very generous for every A1C, they'll uh, give 50 cents to Diabetes Canada. So for them, they're trying to do a win-win. And again, what I would say, even if it's not Dynacare, just know your A1C. And you might be wondering going, well, we live in Canada. It's a free test for me anyhow. But the thing is, they're not charging the province, right? So it's not costing any of us anything. It's not costing anything. And again, for your doctor, it's so simple. If you just say, can you add an A1C? I mean, it's 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 not a special test or anything like that. No, not, nothing extra. Um, Laura, we we do have to wrap up. I want to thank you for being with us. I had a number of questions here about the Diabetes Canada and the information you want to know, uh, want people to know. Where can we go, anybody who's watching this or listening, and to get more information? Yeah, just go to our website, so diabetes.ca. And if you go um, to slash take action right now in Diabetes Awareness Month, we're encouraging everyone to take action. And Emily's taken the best action so far, which is helping to bring a spotlight on this. So. Thank you, Emily, both personally and professionally, but very much personally. I, you know, This is what we have to be doing. Thank How you, Laura. You were the first diabetic I spoke to and you made <laughs> me feel like I wasn't alone. So thank you for your help on the journey. Yeah. How are you doing, Emily, if I can ask? Well, you know, a lot better. It's a work in pro progress, right? Um, I, Like I said, I'd always thought I lived a healthy lifestyle, but with the help of a public health dietitian, I realized there was some fine tuning I could do. Like now, one meal a day is salad. I actually got that tip from Priyanka and Sandy Singh there in episode two, and um, they're the picture of health, but they have diabetes, you know, uh, but 
So these little changes, and I've stepped up my exercise instead of being this regular walker. I've mixed in some interval training. I ended up running the Diabetes Canada 10K, where I did I ran a quarter and walked three quarters to make that manageable goal. You know, I've learned about goal setting, and that way I'm tacking it one piece at a time instead of if I don't make all these changes, I'm going to die. You know, so little changes here and there really add up and support is key you know i've had support of my boyfriend my friends my family my colleagues without you guys and everybody in the podcast oh my goodness without you guys i wouldn't have gotten this far but i feel better i feel like i'm accepting life my life has more meaning and i'm embracing the little pleasures you know playing my ukulele <laughs> watering my plants little things like that it, it actually makes your life have more meaning that's a wonderful way to to think about things what a great revelation yeah, it's really like get a progressive disease and all of a sudden you realize how valuable your life is. Thank you so much, Laura Siron, Emily Brass, for taking the time tonight to talk with us. Um, and Emily, thank you for this podcast. Mm -hmm. Thank mm -hmm. you. Thank you, everybody. You've all been a part of it. Type Taboo, yeah. you can find on the CBC Listen app or anywhere you download your favorite podcasts. Thank you for being with us tonight. I'm Janet Stewart here signing off from uh, the CBC Manitoba Newsroom. I'll see you tomorrow night on CBC Winnipeg News at 6. Take care, everybody. Bye. Thanks, Jen.